I'd like to welcome all of y'all to Perseverance Church this Sunday. Um, as most of y'all know, we've got the bathrooms on both sides, and there's a chair left in the back for anybody that needs it. Um, we're also live streaming, and the thing, it, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, today and next Sunday, we will receive our Thanksgiving offerings during morning worship. The Thanksgiving offering benefits um, the colleges, universities, seminars, and um, uh, divinity houses affiliated with the Christian Church. Uh, Monday, praise group practice at 7 o'clock. And Wednesday, Bible study has ended. A uh, Bible study has ended for November. Um, Bible study will begin December 6th. Um, If y'all don't mind uh, joining me in an in, in invocation prayer, um, if y'all don't mind praying with me, dear Lord, please help us be thankful for the things that we take for granted every day. Our families, our friends, our church family, our great community we are blessed to be living in, and the amazing country we have the privilege of calling our home. And Lord, on this Sunday, please help us to be especially thankful for the brave men and women that sacrifice so much to protect this country we love. We pray that you will help us um, to spread your love and grace to pursue our nation and with the rest of the world to walk closer with you. In the, norm, in the Lord's name we pray, amen. Um, now, now, if y'all, Billy's going to tell us a little something about Got a couple of things before the uh, opening hymn. If y'all want to sit down, please do. Roger, you are just sitting down. Uh, minute permission, you should have a, an envelope in your bulletin. Uh, this Sunday, we take up one of the six special <laughs> offerings that we take during the year for uh, the general ministers of the church. Next month, We'll adopt a budget of a Perseverance Church for 2024. It takes a certain amount of money to operate the church, keep the lights on and heat and keep up the building and pay the preacher and whatever else comes along. The same thing is true for the regional church and the general church. Regional church is all the Christian churches in Virginia. The general church is all the Christian churches in the United States and Canada. Perseverance gets their money, gets our money from you. When we pass the plate and you put it in there, that's where we get our money to spend to keep the church running. Hopefully some of those people listening online will send us a little. Uh, but that's where our money comes from. The regional church and the general church gets their money from us. When we adopt the budget next month, there'll be one line item in it, and it's been in there all my life, that goes to the general church. And that money is split between the regional church and the general church. And that's how they operate. It takes a lot more money to operate the regional church than the general church does to operate Perseverance. So they depend on us to operate. In addition to that, we send our money to Disciples Mission Fund. It's just a name for where we send it. Uh, some of us remember when it used to be basic mission finance, and a few of us remember when it used to be unified promotion. But right now it's... Uh, is Disciples Mission Fund, and they distribute the money all over the general church. In addition to that pot of money that comes from the churches within the general church, we also take up six special offerings a year. Four of them are listed on that envelope you got, Easter, Pentecost, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. The other two are Reconciliation, and maybe the one we are most familiar with, we can Compassion, because that's the one that provides disaster relief through the Christian church. This is how we minister beyond perseverance. This is how we minister beyond Dundas. Not many of us are going to venture into those places that need a lot of help. But by giving to the general church, we're able to provide a ministry throughout the world. Today, the Thanksgiving offering is the one that goes to higher education. Christian Church is affiliated with and helps to support 15 colleges scattered from Virginia all the way to California, all over the country. The ones that we are most familiar with are the local ones, 
as Barton College then in uh, Wilson, North Carolina, which used to be Atlantic Christian. We knew it as Atlantic Christian. And there's the University of Lynchburg in Lynchburg, Virginia, that we knew as Lynchburg College. A lot of people from here have gone to Lynchburg College. I mean, a lot of people. And, uh, and we've always had a close relationship with Lynchburg. The regional offices are in Lynchburg. A lot of the regional assemblies and meetings are in Lynchburg. Uh, in addition to those 15 colleges, we also support seven seminaries. The one we are most familiar with is Lexington Theological Seminary in Lexington, Kentucky. And the reason we are most familiar with that is because most of our ministers come from there. Half of the ministers that we've hired in my adult, adult life were trained at Lexington. So we have a close relationship with them. Today is our opportunity to, su to support those 15 colleges and seven universities. If you feel so inclined to support them, you put it in this envelope. If you don't put it in this envelope, whatever you put in the plate goes to support perseverance. And either way, thank you. Now we would like to um, look at the our prayer concerns. Is there any new names we're going to add to the prayer list this week? All right, so now uh, the meditation of morning prayer. Oh, yes, ma'am. Here you go. We'll go. We'll do our uh, lit, um, our litany for the veterans. Sorry about that. So in your bulletins, you have the um, litany. Right. We pause to remember those who go to war in our name. Remind us, O oh God, that the goal of any war need be justice and peace. And seek to bind up the wounds of those who serve. And remind us, dear God, that the widow, the orphan, the widower, and the veteran all know the cost of war. And we pray for a time when peace will reign and swords become plowshares once more, that war be known only in history books. And we give thanks, gracious God, that you remain with us as we celebrate the service of all who dare to go forth in our name. Remind us that such service is not a movie, an adventure, nor something to be glorified. Remind us that war is a failure by us to overcome hatred with love, injustice with righteousness, violence with peace. We give thanks for those who protect us from such failures. May we truly be your people and be makers of peace. Amen. Now the uh, moment of meditation and, the, and morning prayer.
now it's time for meditation and morning prayer. Sorry about that. Let us pray. O holy God, there have always been wars because there have always been problems between human beings. And as long as there has been history, battle lines have been drawn and people have fought with one another. And we wish it were not so. And that as human beings, we had the kind of love and insight that would prevent war. But it is so, and we don't have that kind of love and insight. We offer our prayers for all those who have volunteered or have been drafted. We thank you for their courage and often their heroism as they have faced the enemy in battle. We praise their selfless acts in behalf of fellow soldiers. We lift up their wisdom gathered from you and from the battlefield and commend their eternal souls to your loving and forgiving care. We remember especially all who presently serve in the armed forces of this and other countries, and we pray for continued safety and welfare. We thank you for those presently serving in our military. As they encounter danger, give them the insight to understand life and death and enable them to be at peace with you and with themselves. Bless the families of all who serve in the armed forces, and let your Holy Spirit rest upon them like a mantle to preserve them from anxiety and harm. Grant to each and every one of us a reminder of the way life itself is a struggle between good and evil, and prepare us to defend the good and not succumb to the evil we encounter. We pray for our loved ones this morning that are on our prayer list and new names that have been added. We pray for their healing. We pray for peace. We pray for strength. We also give thanks for new babies, new sisters and new brothers and new friends. And we offer thanksgiving for our longtime friends. And we offer thanksgiving for our family. Lord, hear this morning our private prayers, those that we are unable to speak this morning. Lord, listen to our private prayers. And Lord, we pray the prayer that your son Jesus Christ taught us to pray, praying together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
from thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we come to the communion table. And after the communion this morning that our children will depart for Children's Church this morning. We give thanks for our Children's Church. We give thanks for our children. This is the joyful feast. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. <clears throat> Scripture tells us from Luke 13 that they will come from the east and the west, and they will come from the north and the south to sit at the table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all those who trust him to share the feast that he has prepared, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Our hymn of invitation, I mean, I'm sorry, our, our hymn of communion is on page 597. Take my life and let it be. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for communion this morning.
After giving thanks, he broke it. He said, Take it. This is my body. And likewise, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, Take, drink all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant. Poured out forgiveness of your sins. Do this.
We offer to you, O God, the gift of our hands and the loyalty of our hearts. Accept us with our gifts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to have some special music from our adult choir. So there's a lot of things that make music special. Today, what's going to make it special is you're going to sing along with it. And that's going to make it special for us. If you don't mind turning in your hymnals to page 637, the words of this song are absolutely gorgeous and so appropriate as we honor our God. Sing loudly now. We'll be listening.
Thank you to Daniel for leading us this morning, and thank you to the special for our special speaker. It is wonderful to be here and to honor our veterans. And as you know, that on Friday, I believe, was the day, the observed day, and then yesterday was, I believe, what we call the actual day. And I had a the pleasure of going to a veteran service last night in Chase City. And Carrie uh, sang, and she sang four songs during that special time. And many veterans were honored, uh, one being from World War II. And it was a wonderful, uh, it was at the Lee Building, the auditorium, if you've ever been there before, a beautiful auditorium. Do we have any veterans this morning that we can recognize? If you would please stand for any, any veterans who have served. So we have Billy, so, um, and we also know, and we have Carrie, and we have Wayne, and we have C, and we know we also have other veterans as well in our congregation. So if you would please just give a hand for their service. their distinguished service, and we are so grateful for those who have served in our congregation and in this community as well. We give thanks for that. Our two scriptures this morning comes from the lectionary for this Sunday, and it is from 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, if you'd like to follow along. And also Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. The first one is written from Paul, and the second one is from the author, which is uh, presumed to be Matthew, the disciple. And he is speaking, and he is saying the parable, one of the parables of Jesus. Listen to the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. From Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. Then all of those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And when they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. 
May God bless the reading of God's holy word. Would you please pray with me? Almighty gracious God, may the words of my mouth be acceptable unto you, and may the meditations of our hearts be also. Amen. So this morning I have selected two readings, and both of these readings have a commonality because both readings address the early Christians' anxiety about Christ's return because in one they are grieving the loss of their loved ones, and in the second reading Matthew sees the church concerned about salvation. This proverbial question, so then how shall we leave, is important. And is important back then because they were grieving the loss of their loved ones. But it's also important to us because our longevity far exceeds that of our ancient ancestors. Amen? We experience pain after losing a loved one to death, but we also live with our own questions or our own anxieties, such as how shall we as Christians live if we can no longer move as easily as what we used to? Amen? And that's probably for most of us, no matter our age. And how shall we live in a world filled with fraught? Is that not a good question for today's time? Paul's word of comfort and Jesus' teaching is intended to help the early Christians answer those tough questions about how we should live in the period between now and the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ or how we might frame this anxiety that we have today with how can we sing it as well with my soul and actually mean it. Amen? Paul's letter to the early church in Thessalonica was one of the earliest letters that the church had. And these letters were proof that the early Christians needed help they needed help to know how to live faithfully to the way that Jesus was calling them in the world and how to live in Jesus' absence. And isn't that what we do today? If not in words, but in thoughts to try to figure this all out, that what are we to do while we wait for Jesus to return? And many scholars write that this church was Paul's first church plant. And I think that you know by experience the very special relationship that a pastor has with their first church post-seminary. Amen? If I'm not mistaken, Anthony's first church was Perseverance Christian Church. Is that correct? And Eric's first church was Perseverance Christian Church post-seminary. And is it not correct that they have a very special relationship with you? Amen? So Paul loves this church. Very special to him. And as time goes on, and Paul is spreading the gospel and starting other churches, because that's what he's called to do, he thinks back to this special church. And he calls upon Timothy and says, hey, go check on this church in Thessalonica and see how they're doing. And they were doing well, but they had concerns and they needed answers. And after once visiting and establishing the church, the Apostle Paul was unable to return for whatever reason. Maybe it was a time he was in prison for his faith. So he sends Timothy to check on them. 
And Timothy tells Paul that they're doing well, but they have some questions. And they have some concerns, and it's not something I could have answered. And the main concern for them is that their loved ones were passing away. And they're concerned that they would might, might not be present with them when Jesus returns. So Dr. Beverly Giventa, professor of New Testament at Baylor University, writes of this passage. And she says for the Thessalonians that the Perugio, which is the second coming of Jesus, seemed so imminent, about to happen, that they believed none within the community would die before Jesus' return. And the death of believers that have now occurred was prompting a trauma. What can it mean that the believers have died and will? what will happen to those at the second coming? An answer Paul provides is both theological, but it's also pastoral. Paul writes in Thessalonians what will happen. And we, when we look and we talk about salvation, that we look at Revelation and we also look to this passage. And Paul writes that the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call and with the sound of God's trumpet, and all Christians, dead and still living, are caught up in the clouds where they will meet the Lord in the air. We believe as Christians when we pass this life that our soul goes straight to heaven. Paul says that nothing can separate us from the love of God, that we are all we are automatically with God that moment that we take our last breath. If you read the newsletter, this past newsletter that we had, that there's a quote, I believe, from Billy Graham that says, our last breath of heaven in heaven and on earth is our first breath in heaven. Paul answers their question about death and the second coming. Today, we too can ask that same question. How shall we live when grief washes over us, when we lose a loved one? How shall we live when we hear that a loved one dies on the battlefield? How shall we live when someone close to us has passed before we have? The kind of comfort that the Apostle Paul offers is an insurance to us. And that's an A-S-S-U-R-A-N-C-E, not an I-N-S-U-R-A-N-C-E. That someday we will not hurt the way that we do now and that our loved ones will join us in the heaven. And what can, where can, what can we find also comforting in Paul's letter is that he writes that we, and this is in the first chapter, that, that, salt, that, that beginning of the letter, that we, which is Paul, Silas, and Timothy, do not want you to be ignorant of these things. And I find that most comforting because how we stand up for our faith, how we practice it, if we lack the knowledge about it, then it's hard to be able to teach others why we believe the way that we do. Paul doesn't want this favored church of his to be ignorant of the Christian faith. And so he keeps in touch and he checks on their well-being. Now, their life had to be complicated because Thessalonica was a Greek city. It was a port city. It was located on a major Roman highway that had been under Roman rule for two centuries. It was a capital of the province of Macedonia, the seat of Roman administration. They had a certain political significance so to say that they were exposed to a lot 
would just even be little to say. They had a lot of influences. They lived in a city filled with Greek life where many worship deities, many social and cultural influences like we have today. But yet this congregation remained committed to the work of Jesus. And this lesson is a testament that we too can remain faithful to the way that Jesus calls us to live despite our outside influences of wealth, of greed, of immoral acts perpetrated by humankind. I think in one of the Sunday school lessons not too long ago, I heard someone say, think of the seven deadly sins as a, to remind us that it is pride and envy and wrath and gluttony and lust and sloth and greed. And Paul informs this beloved Christian community that they can remain faithful to the way of Jesus when they know and practice the faith. And the faith tells us that one day we will be reunited with our loved ones in heaven. Let us hear again Paul's words. The Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call and with the sound of God's trumpet, all Christians, dead and still living, are caught up in the clouds where they will meet the Lord in the air. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are the authors of this letter, but in chapter 2, we see Paul starting to speak alone. And Paul wrote this letter not to chastise, this favored church. They weren't doing anything wrong but to thank them and to answer the concerns that he heard about and to further instruct them how to live. And because there's a reference to you turning from idols, we know this church was primary Gentile and they turned from idols to the one true God, to the God of Abraham, once they accepted Jesus as their Savior. Now that Paul has done his due diligence and relieved the members of this church about what will happen to their loved ones that have passed, they can now concentrate on what Paul is telling them to do. In verses 1 through 7, Paul tells these early believers. And in chapter 4, verse 11, he says to do this to lead a quiet life. Another sermon will talk about that. Please don't think that means that you have to be quiet as a mouse when you go to your home this evening. <laughs> lead a quiet life. Probably means no drama, though. Second, to mind your own business. Amen? Amen? And third, and I'm preaching to the choir here, and third, to work with your own hands, amen, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders so that they will not be dependent on others. It gives them hope, and I hope that it gives us hope. It gave them purpose, and I hope it gives us hope. If you've ever gotten a letter and you had to reread several sentences, sometimes you may have even highlighted a particular sentence or two. In 1 Thessalonians, this is one place to take out your highlighter. To lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on others. This gives us hope. We believe in the resurrection of the body. And here too, Paul proclaims it to be so. But Paul also wants the members of this early church also to be a beacon of light and hope 
to live with assurance of the next life while living on earth and going about their work. And in turning briefly to the gospel reading, our story in Matthew also teaches us the same thing. Matthew writes for the early church that they are to keep busy while also keeping alert for the second coming of Christ, to be on guard, to continue the ministry of Jesus Christ, to keep their light burning brightly so when Jesus returns, they won't be caught off guard and the gates to the heavenly banquet will receive them. There are many illustrations that might, we might consider here to grasp Matthew's point, such as not having our affairs in order when we need to when trouble arises, so we're not caught off guard, or not being prepared when bad weather strikes and our neglect costs us more, or not having a rainy day fund which can put us or our family in dire straits, or not having enough food in the house for emergencies which will really make us feel worse than we already did. But Matthew goes a little further in instruction, and he's really specific. He tells these Jewish Christians that the gate to heaven, the wedding banquet, will be closed if they slumber, if they abandon their faith, if they are no longer being fruitful, if they're no longer being fruit bearing, or if they lose their light or lose their oil. In all things, no matter what is happening in our world today, because if you're like me, that you have seen the tragedies in Israel, in Gaza. So no matter what's happening in our world today, we must live with hope. We must look to our faith, and we must trust that Jesus is among his children here and there and all around the globe. And to carry on with our own work, Remembering that we are called to work for justice, to love mercy, which means to be merciful to those who need it, to be merciful to our neighbors and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are called to still do our work. We are called to still care for the widows. We are called to still care for the hungry and we are called to still walk humbly with our God. So how should we live? First, let us live in ways that shows others to whom we belong and where we place our allegiance to continue our work with the gifts and talents that God has given all of us so others can see our calling that we have undertaken as believers and as followers of Jesus. For as we do, not only will we be able to provide for our families, but we will also be a witness to those living in dark places for what it looks like to follow Jesus. Second, to trust in the promises of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, that one day, he will return, the earth will be restored, and that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, will, re will reign forever and ever. Thanks, God. Thanks be to the Lord. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is on page 589, Here I Am, Lord. If you have not professed Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you would like to do that this morning, I invite you to come during this, this hymn of invitation and I would extend the right hand of fellowship and I will ask you that question if you believe that the Lord, that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And it's that simple.
and that if you haven't been baptized, that we would schedule that. If you would like to transfer your membership here to Perseverance, we invite you to come forward as well. And again, I would extend the right hand of fellowship. Would you please rise as we sing, Here I Am, Lord, on page 589. <laughs>